The Business of Biotech is produced by Life Science Connect and its community of learning, solving, and sourcing resources for biopharma decision makers. If you're working on biologics process development and manufacturing challenges, you need to swing by bioprocessonline.com. If you're trying to stay ahead of the cell or gene therapy curve, visit cellandgene.com. When it's time to map out your clinical course, let clinicalleader.com help. And if optimizing outsourcing decisions is what you're after, check out outsourcepharma.com. We're Life Science Connect, and we're here to help. Welcome back to the business of biotech. I'm Matt Piller. And if you're a biotech exec who's tired or beaten down or dejected or struggling, coming off a of failure, running out of money, contemplating your next move, or any or all of these things, yeah. this episode is for you. My guest today is Leonard Mazur, co-founder, CEO, and chairman of multimodal biopharma, Sidious Pharmaceuticals. He's a guy who, for more than 50 years, uh, has been in the life science business leadership role. Uh, he's got 50 plus years in his rear view, and he just can't seem to stop. He's won and he's lost. He's scrapped. And most recently, he's bootstrapped to drive Sidious forward in its multimodal, multi indication quest to address cancer, infection, ARDS, and more. On today's episode, we'll gain insight into some of the lessons that Leonard's learned about highs and lows on his long journey as a biotech exec, and we'll get a glimpse into the mentality that's kept him motivated all these years. Leonard, welcome to the show. Hey, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Appreciate the pleasure's, pleasure's mine. I've uh, We had the chance to catch up a, a couple of weeks ago. I enjoyed every minute of it, and I'm looking forward to uh, picking your brain a little bit for the benefit of our audience. Um and speaking of that conversation we had a couple of weeks ago, uh, I, I remember it started out with a pretty, a, a pretty uh, pro profound and uh, explicit statement that you made where you said, Hey buddy, I didn't have to do this. <laughs> I, <laughs> <laughs> and, and when I say do this, I mean, co-found Sidious. Uh, <clears throat> so, so tell us uh, why did you, you, you know, what would you do it for if you didn't have to? Well, I think, you know, what, uh, I've always uh, enjoyed having a, a challenge in front of me, and I couldn't imagine continuing ahead without that. Not that uh, you, you can certainly create them if you want to. And uh, for me, the, the, uh, the, the being in a pharmaceutical uh, business and industry has, uh, has always been something I enjoyed. All right, I, I have enjoyed every minute of being in this business. So, uh, and that, uh, you know, uh, you can have all, you can have as many challenges as you want in there, and it, it can be difficult at times, but uh, you've got to really, uh, I, I think a lot of the people that I associate with in the business, they actually have a passion for the business. Mm -hmm. And uh, a good number of folks that I've met are like that. So, uh, we we have a unique industry in that in that regard. So, but the challenge is what I like. So that's why I did it. Yeah, the challenge is it the uh, is it like what what motivates that challenge? Is it you know is it the thrill of the hunt? Is it the degree of difficulty? I mean, it's an incredibly difficult business. Is it uh, you know is it the potential payoff? Like what, what where's the motivation to wanna? I don't know. Something that people the, the fear of failure. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, you know, I mean, if if it were the fear of failure for most in this business, uh, they they check out in a hurry because failure right, is sort right. of the norm. Right, right. Yeah, no, I think you know. I think um, you pick your challenges, of course. And you know, uh, I I've had I had several experiences already starting from zero. So when you start from zero, it's a whole different uh, experience. And zero really means zero. So uh, it's not like you suddenly have, uh, you know, a big venture capital fund behind you and, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of security there and so forth. Uh, uh, but when you start from zero, you're, uh, you're on your own and it's on your back and uh, it's up to you to make it happen. Yeah. So uh, with Sidious, uh, I was fortunate also that uh, there was a co-founder with me, Myron Halubiak, who used to be a uh, president at Roche Labs. Uh, I'd known him for a long, long time. 
And uh, I think uh, uh, we always I think we always wanted to work together with each other. And finally, uh, we created that uh, that opportunity. Mm hmm. Yeah. Is there a, so the, 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 give us a little more on the backstory of the, of the founding of, of Sidious. Uh, how, how did it sort of form up? What did it evolve from? It, it evolved from a conversation, actually discussions that we had. And then uh, it led to, uh, we had one product opportunity that uh, someone had presented to us that was a very late, late, late phase uh, drug, almost approvable in some ways. And uh, so what we did is uh, we uh, we went out there and saw uh, tried to see if we could get some uh, some capital raised for it. Uh, it uh, it just did not work out the way we thought it could. So then uh, what happened was uh, I had had some previous uh, experience in contact with uh, with MD Anderson on a drug that they were working on. At the time, uh, when uh, at one point uh, I had incubated a dermatological products company that uh, acquired uh, we acquired Minison from Wyatt, and what happened was, uh, which was a, a, a an acne product it was a it was a an antibiotic for acne. Mm -hmm. So we had a we had a dermatological uh, company with Derm Sales Force and everything. That was uh, that was trucking along really nice, and about a year after we did that acquisition, I get a call one day from the Department of Defense, and they said to me, they said, uh, uh, "We're contacting you because uh, we are treating soldiers that were wounded in Iraq and Afghanistan in a hospital in Germany." for a certain type of bacterial infection with minocycline IV. And we can't continue the treatment here because uh, the uh, the drug was pulled off the market a number of years ago. Mm. What happened was Wyeth had the medicine IV out there with the regular, uh, with the capsules as well, but they launched another hospital-based uh, antibiotic, so they didn't want to have two, so they dropped it. Mm. So he his request to me was, can we bring that drug back? And I said, I said, you know, that's uh, first of all, I said, we're not even a hospital company. We're a derm company. Yeah. And uh, we have no expertise in that end, uh, no coverage, nothing. And he begged me to, to, to see if we could do something. So I thought, all right. Um, I sat down at that time. Uh, uh, I had a partner. He passed away. Uh, but, uh, he and I sat there. We discussed it. And I said, "Look, let's uh, let's do the the right thing here. Let's do this out of loyalty. It's not out of profit or anything like that. I'm certainly not going to make any money at this thing. But let's see what we can do to bring it back." So we we did have. We were fortunate. We had a good regulatory person in our staff, and it took about a year, and we got it qualified. I mean, to, to get all this set up was complicated. It had overseas sourcing. It had all kinds of issues. So then, what we did is we put two people on it. That's all to cover hospitals. Okay, mm. this is so absurd. But nevertheless, uh, we did that. And at one point, I noticed we we're getting a lot of revenue out of uh, MD Anderson. So guy arranged to go down there. And I meet with the chief of infectious disease, Dr. Isam Rad, and I find out that they're not buying a drug to treat anybody. They were buying it. They were doing experiments. He was trying to come up with something that would work in uh, uh, for infected catheters. Mm. So um, it was so early on, there was nothing I could do with it. So basically, what happened was ultimately we sell off the Durham company and everything. And then you know a couple of years go by, and uh, so Myron and myself go down at uh, the MD Anderson and we meet with. Uh, with Dr. Rad, and we found out that he had really evolved this drug uh, or his concept and what he was looking for, because he was experimenting with a bunch of different antibiotics. So uh, he had he was already uh, getting ready to go into the clinic. He had something that uh, they thought would work with minocycline in it, and uh, uh, so we funded the phase two B work. That's how we got started. So it, and it was only because of the fact. 
that that drug came back the way it came back, that he was able to do that. Yeah. So, but that was kind of the beginnings of uh, of the company. So, yeah. you know, it was uh, it was interesting. It was taking a chance on something way back. Not even taking a chance. We did it not for taking a chance. We did it because of uh, patriotism, loyalty. I, you know, I was uh, I served in the U.S. Marine Corps Reserve, so uh, so anything for uh, people that are willing to fight for their country, fine. You know, if we can do that, let's do it. Yep. Uh, exemplary, illustrative of your uh, your willingness to take on a challenge. Uh, thank you for your your service, by the way. As I understand it, uh, you, you served in the in the Marine Corps uh, many years after you emigrated to the United States from Germany. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, uh, we we thank you for your service, and uh, that that's that's a compelling story. Uh, you. I wanted to ask you a few questions about the funding of cities because I know you've got a lot of your own skin in the game. So, at what point, right. sort of, at what point in that, Colonel, you said you fit, you funded the Phase Two B study. Uh, was it around there that you started yeah. inv- investing? Yeah, that's your when own? we started. We started putting our own money in, and basically, we funded a good part of that trial. And uh, and then we realized that uh, we needed to have uh, external financing as well because. Uh, it would take uh, it would take a significant sum of money to get there with this. So that's when we uh, uh, we 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 raised some money privately, but for the most part, what we did is uh, there was a public entity called Sidious that I knew about. I had a relationship with uh, the people there. Uh, uh, worked with them at one point. Uh, even uh, had a minor role inside the company. So the uh, uh, we merged in with them. They were public. And then ultimately what we did is, uh, that was 2016, uh, uh, we uh, uh, did an uplisting to NASDAQ 2017, roughly. And we uh, we had a great investment, a good investment bank that we worked with uh, to help us uh, raise capital, uh, H.C. Wainwright, and we started uh, we started our journey really in that, in that regard then. Yeah. You've, uh, I mean, you, you, you've led quite a few life sciences companies over the years, uh, pharmas, biopharmas, um, and, and beyond. Um, how I, I want to kind of dig into how having invested your, your own, you know, have, having your own skin in the game, having invested your own money into the company, um, how that sort of affects the, uh, on, a, on a couple of different, in a couple of different contexts, one, how, how it affects, um, your, uh, I, I get, I guess your, the, the impact, what, what's the impact on your decision-making, like your leadership of the company? Well, I, I look at it like this. I think, uh, when you, when you bring a team together, we had a very small team. I mean, very small team. And, uh, and, and, and it lasted that way for, for a while. It got no bigger than about six people. And, uh, uh, you know, them all, you know, you know, everybody really, really well. You know what their uh, capabilities are. Yeah, uh, we had we had a we have a great CFO, so uh, and that that really helps a lot because his, his attitude and the way he ran things it was like his own like his own money was there. Mm-hmm. So uh, and that uh, again, that that helps an awful lot. You've got to have somebody that can control that uh, that cash for you and highlight for you. If there's a potential issue or, or or something that you need to be thinking about, and we were always conscientious about uh, what our forward uh, obligations were looking like and what we needed to to take care of that, we always wanted to make sure that we had sufficient cash reserves in the company to be able to go out for one year and beyond. So uh, and that uh, that was always a guiding principle. For us, and and we and we ran things that way. So uh, it's because if you, I, I was very accustomed to running a revenue-producing company. That was my real experience base, yeah. doing acquisitions of uh, of revenue-producing drugs, and 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 managing a business in that fashion. When you get into the research-based side of this world, it's totally different. Because you don't have that constant, uh, you can't turn the spigot on 
and all of a sudden here comes a flood of revenue. You can't do that. Right. It's not there. In fact, uh, what's happening is the water is slowly being drained out of your <laughs> your <laughs> cash. All right. Yeah. Your cash is like a water, like I'd being in a bathtub and pull the plug and it's going down. So uh, you you need to be conscious of that all the time. Yeah. When you, uh, w- your, your first experience with that, you know, that, that phenomenon, like we're, a, we're, a, we're a cash spending company, not a cash making company. Um, how, how did you mentally adjust and what advice, what that, advice would you have for, uh, for, for founders and, and startup execs who are seeing that for the first time? I, I have to admit, I had a hard time with it. Okay. Yeah. Psychologically. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and I, and I, I really had to adapt to it. I, I just it was it was not easy at first, and then ultimately the uh, I, I think uh, I recognized that okay, so this is something else that you manage, but now I got to manage it the other way ar- uh, around. And and uh, for me, what it was the raising of capital became the revenue. Mm-hmm. So I had to uh, we had to raise capital, and we had to keep that revenue flow going. Yep. So that was the equivalent of that. So I kind of, uh, that's how I rationalized it uh, in my own mind about it in terms of management. But, and it's not an easy thing to do, especially if you're really accustomed to p and I was, I was so grounded in those principles. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the p and your p and is your burn rate here. So uh, you've got to really be really, really on top of it. Yeah. Did you find yourself, I mean, you've got experience uh, over the years in, in, in business development, obviously working yeah. for working for for-profit companies that are revenue generating. There's the, you know, the business development sales aspect. Did you find yourself applying like principles and, and confidence in, in your business development experience, applying that to oh, uh, fundraising? Yeah, business development is really critical. Uh, and business development, uh, I added the, the dimension that I added to business development was capital raising. Yeah, that was business development. All yeah. right, so uh, I, I recognized uh, pretty quickly that uh, the earlier stage you were, the lesser the probability of getting anything done with a with a with a partner with a big com- you know with a big pharma company or anything or out licensing or trying to do something like that. That that was not really in the cards mm-hmm. for the time being. So. Uh, and so consequently, my business development activity centered on raising capital more yeah. than anything else. And uh, that took the same business development principles that I had elsewhere. And ultimately, what that evolves into is uh, relationships become really critical. They're really important in terms of, uh, of, of capital raising. When you say relationships, are you talking about like di- direct relationships with the the, the investor community? Or are you talking about yeah. relationships? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Completely. You've got to have you've got to have that because uh, it's amazing when you do when you're able to finally uh, get to the point where uh, you've gained a confidence of uh, your, uh, your 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 banks. You, if you have confidence from the banks. They will uh, they will raise capital for you, mm-hmm. no matter. I don't say not no matter what the circumstances, but it's a it's it, it's a significant uh, aspect of this is to be able to to really have a good relationship with your banker, banks. What what was there? That was the sort of the other uh, general context I was curious about in terms of you know you having your own money invested in the company. Um, it, is that viewed as sort of a feather in your cap as a, as a pro from the investment community? Are they, are they more or less likely to want to jump on board when they see uh, that you're. I think it means a lot to investors when they see that you've done that. Uh, when they, uh, when they know you've got skin in the game and you're, uh, you're willing to, in fact, uh, a, a, some, a good number of the raises that we did, I, I went in side by side with uh, with with uh, with with the funds that we're putting money in. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and I think that the fact that I was willing to do that really helped us. It uh, it, it helped us get there. It really helped uh, advance us. 
It uh, it gave a lot of people confidence. It gave our bankers, for sure, uh, uh, significant confidence. So is is that confidence rooted in their uh, understanding that you have a a faith uh, or or belief in the molecule? Is it or is it more rooted in their in their understanding that hey, this guy's this guy's going to treat his money right and our money right because it's we're we're in this together both. It, like we're, it's, a, it's a combination. Yeah. So uh, it's a combination of the fact that uh, uh, they're trusting your judgment, your business judgment, and your judgment about the potential for the company, and their belief in your ability to execute it is important. Really yeah. important that uh, that you can deliver. At the end of the day, we have to deliver. Yeah. Uh, this is a results-oriented business. And uh, at the end of the day, an approval is the the capstone of uh, of what you're doing. Mm-hmm. You've got you've got to deliver that. Yeah, and we know that. Yeah. <laughs> do you find uh, Do you find yourself um, managing in a more perhaps frugal or conservative fashion uh, in in this business than perhaps th- than you did in a in a revenue generating business? No. No, I'm a. I consider myself a risk taker. So I always look at the world. There are risk takers and there are risk averters, uh, and, and a vast majority of people are risk averters. But there's yeah. a certain percentage of us. Uh, we're risk takers. Yeah. So you know, I'll never forget. Uh, uh, somebody gave me this this statement one time. A saying that said. Unless you, if you're not living on the edge, then you're taking up too much space. <laughs> <laughs> I always found that fascinating. <laughs> yeah, oh. I, I like that. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, you know, and yeah, I mean, it's not lost on us that you you need to be a risk taker in this business because, like I said, failure is the norm. Uh, and and you you've taken. I mean, Sidious has taken steps uh, with its pipeline. I think to uh, to to. Uh, uh, I guess temper temper failure. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the, the the pipeline and the strategy there. Um, but knowing, like, how how do you rec- how do you reconcile being a risk taker in a business where failure is so common? This is this is the this is the part you said. You, you, you said something about psychoanalysis. This is the part where I psychoanalyze you. <laughs> uh, I'm well aware of what the statistics are here, and there is a high failure rate. Uh, you know, this is like uh, this is like wildcat drilling for oil, and you know you're going to come up dry, and you're going to you you're going to hit you're going to hit it also. Mm-hmm. So um, I think uh, I I think what uh, we try to do is uh, is really manage it by virtue of the fact that uh, the asset that uh, that we've chosen. To work with here, take uh, the one that we uh, licensed out of uh, out of MD Anderson. We really went further with that. That we went further. We we took it deeper and deeper as uh, because they had a good they had a good data set. They had a, they had a phase two B trial that looked really great, mm-hmm. and uh, with that, uh, we thought we could uh, we can bring this to the market and uh, and and get it ultimately approved. So I wasn't. Uh, uh, I had a lot of confidence in that. All right. Same thing with uh, when um, we had, uh, uh, well, when we got Lymphir. All right. Here was a drug that was on the market once and had been uh, taken off the market by the by ESI at the time because mm-hmm. they had a reformulation requirement from the FDA to remove some unfolded proteins. So basically, uh, and they didn't have enough inventory to go either way, both ways. So they decided pull it off the market, complete the reformulation, bring it back to market. And the FDA asked them when they did that, they they came back with the results. They said, uh, this is a new drug. You got to do a phase three study with uh, uh, 71 patients in a lead-in trial. So, uh, what happened was when we got to that, when we got to the point of uh, where we were on a on a buy out of that license, they were on their very last patient 
on a on a phase three trial, last patient in, and uh, I really believe I, I thought for sure, and I'm, I'm still maintaining it'll happen, is that this is approvable. Uh, that uh, since it's got a history to it, uh, it was on the market. It had acceptance uh, when it was on the market. It's a very rare disease. It had it had all it had a real. It's not going to require a giant investment to go out and market it. So uh, there were there were attri- attributes about it, and one of the other attributes that uh, uh, it, it had a very unique mechanism of action. So basically. What we try to look for is, if at all possible, is the uniqueness, uniqueness of what we're working with. That's another another aspect. Minilock, uh, our antibiotic lock solution from Andy Anderson, is a very, very unique product. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's nothing like it on the market, nothing being studied. So uh, that, again, is, a, is another attribute in terms of, uh, at least from my point of view, the risk-taking side can uh, can work in your favor. Yeah. Yeah, I mean uh, so there these are unique candidates candidates you've mentioned so far are unique in that, you know, for instance they were on the market then pulled off the market, needed to right. be reformulated so on and so yeah. forth. Do, do you look for those uh do you look for those unique opportunities or is it more serendipity? We, have, uh, sometimes we do look for them. So uh, and um we uh and people you know people People are always contacting you with opportunities. Mm-hmm. So when they know you're in a business, you'll you, they come in over the transom, more or less. Yeah. So, uh, you you you, you once uh, every once in a while, there comes one that's really uh, worthwhile to look at. Yeah, let me. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I wanted to ask you some questions about the pipeline, but we're we're kind of there right now, so I'm gonna bounce around a little bit here. But while while we're talking about that pipeline strategy and the and the variety of it. Um, you know, you, you've mentioned some antibiotic products. Uh, you've got uh, um, you've got a, a, a stem cell therapy product in the works. Um, you know, some, several different modalities that you, that you've uh, and indications. I mean, there's a broad, broad swath of indications. What's what's the strategy there? So uh, I should mention that uh, some of these things, some, sort of what happens here is uh, we do get into it. But then, when we get into it, we make we make a decision not to take it uh, much further. Mm-hmm. So the stem cell product at this moment, uh, that's not uh, we're not really devoting any uh, significant resources there. Yeah, uh, because of uh, what we learned after we got into it. Right. So we've, uh, we've uh, more or less have, uh, uh, just uh, put a put a hold on it for for the time being until yeah. we see if there's any further developments. Yeah. So. Uh, but but in terms of the broader sort of strategy, you know, even the even the fact that you took a took a flyer on that, like took a, took a look at it and shelved it for a little while, right. like right. you know, it sort of fell outside the norm of uh, right. of where you lived. I, I, right. Is there a strategy behind that? Yeah, like, there is. So ba- basically, uh, it once you once you once you know, either way, it's a go or no go. Be a big boy, make up your mind about it, and say, "Okay, we're stopping." And mm-hmm. sometimes your ego should not get in the way of that whatsoever. Yeah, you got to keep it out of that because, uh, because uh, you know, I've encountered, I've seen that in the past, and uh, that's a very bad driver at times. So uh, you get to the point, you've got information, you've got good information, act on it. Is the um the the ego that you mentioned when when you say uh, your ego do you mean at the as, at the anybody's, leadership level? Any, yeah, anybody's ego, correct? I've, yeah, I've, yeah. I've seen those. I've seen those mistakes. Yeah, well, I've right. had conversations with uh, with other execs who have talked about like when they decide to either go or, or more often than obviously no go. Like if they no go a project, then there are specific people, you know, at the research or director level right. on that project. There's ego there too, right? Like it's their baby. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Yeah. How do you man- how do you manage them away from their egos? <laughs> you have to, you have to, you, there's, it's not easy. It's yeah. it's not easy because uh, it gets it it gets emotional, and once emotion gets attached to it, look out. When it comes to turning your innovations into clinical realities, the first step is transforming your process. 
On the Business of Biotech podcast, we bring Emerging Biotech's weekly insights to advance their pipelines, from funding to regulatory and other need-to-know topics. The pod is brought to you in collaboration with Cytiva, a global provider of technologies and services that advance and accelerate the development, manufacture, and delivery of therapeutics. Check out their resources at citiva.com backslash emerging biotech. That's C-Y-T-I-V-A dot com backslash emerging biotech. You also told me uh, when we talked a couple of weeks back, you, you made a comment about this business being entirely different, uh, completely different operation than it was 10, 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to dig into what you mean by that. Like, did, did you mean this business meaning uh, the specific business that you're that you're involved in and running, or do you mean the business in the in the turn in the sense of the the greater industry? Well, I think uh, uh, both. So uh, there's evolution on both sides of both of it. So basically, start with our company. We, uh, uh, you know, it's different. We went uh, from six people to to we're at twenty two people right now. All mm-hmm. right. And uh, Saudi will say, hey, well, uh, there are other people, other companies have thousands. What are you talking about? Yeah, but that percentage increase, that 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 equates to something. Right. That percentage increase equates that. And all the people that we brought on board are all professionals. It's not like we've got, uh, you know, four secretaries in here, or four mid-level. We don't. They're mm-hmm. all, all high caliber professionals and in various disciplines. So... That, you know, when we when we were at six, we didn't have that. We contracted everything out in terms of uh, expertise, and it was just managing managing consultants more or less. But now it's actually managing that effort itself, and uh, with your own staff, and that uh, that's very different compared to where we were. So that's mm-hmm. one that, that that was our evolution. So, but the industry itself. I've I've seen this industry go through. Uh, I I think it's gone through changes. I think, uh, uh, you know, it used to be, uh, for example, spec pharma. You don't even hear that anymore. That term, spec yeah. pharma, was hot. All right, buying revenues. Uh, you know, I'm talking about. You know, if you think about the Valiant model and what they did. All right, and others as well. So there was a whole host. There was a cadre of uh, people operating in that universe. Then one day, it all dried up. Mm-hmm. It all dried up financially, completely. The whole that, that whole segment of the market just disappeared. So uh, almost. Yeah. So so on the biotech side, that uh, that's even had, uh, you know, I think uh, biotech will always have the same principles though going forward. And that is that uh, it's, it's high, very high risk because, uh, a lot of it is very early stage, and uh, you're investing in 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 some basic scientific breakthrough concept that uh, uh, you've got to put. You got to recognize. You got to put the money up to take it all through that whole uh, preclinical side to get it to a point to get it into the clinic, and so uh, that universe is really bifurcated. Those that are on the preclinical side. Those that are are in the clinical side and, and those that are in be, in between, so it's not even bifurcated; it's trifurcated. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so it, uh, that side that side has not changed an awful lot. I, I, at least that's my perception. I think what happened here also is that uh, it's probably the financial side is where the pressure points have uh, evolved, and that is that. Uh, uh, the, money, the the capital raising for the earlier stage companies was a lot easier five years ago, or longer, maybe a little bit longer. Right. And there was there was I think a lot of a lot of new companies got created in that yeah. process. All right. Now now the rubber's really starting to hit the road in here, and and the capital is not that easy. The flow of forget about the any IPO flow. Forget about it. It's uh, it's 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 low. It's nowhere near what it was. So there is there's there's changes there, and it's cyclical. So that uh, that part of it is uh, is another aspect of this. We we are, whether people want to admit it or not, 
there's a cyclical, cyclical aspect to what uh, what's going on more in that world than I would say in a pharma world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. As, as far as the investment cycles are concerned and the fact that money is harder to come by now, do you find Sidious in an advantageous position given the fact that you've got, you, you don't have like giant gaps in your pipeline, for instance, you've got a, a late phase three candidate that, yeah. um, it, it, you know, ha- has some challenges, but we'll, we'll, we'll address it in, in a minute, okay. but it's, it's getting there. Like, does, does that put you in a in an advantageous yeah. position? No, we're absolutely in an advantageous position as a result of that. There's no there's no two ways about it. So yeah. we, well, you know, we know we can knock on a door. We could, you know, the 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 only word everybody's concerned about for us is dilution. All right, whether uh, you know, so but uh, we know we can we can access capital mm-hmm. because yeah. because of our portfolio uh, is uh, is advanced as as it is. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Advanced. And like I said, without, without giant gaps. Um, yeah. And I, I want to talk about some of the the highs and lows in, in recent, uh, you know, in recent months. Right. So yeah. just this summer, you guys reported uh good phase three clinical progress and favorable data on your late stage uh, candidate. Minol, Minolock? Minolock, right. M- Minolock. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then in short order, received a CRL letter on another on, on limb fear. Right. Um, so uh, I guess the general question where, where I'd start with this one would be like, what advice, I mean, you've got a lot of experience with these things, you know, you, you've worked with the FDA for a long, long time, you know, what's coming down the pike. Uh, what, what's your advice to folks who maybe haven't seen some of those ups and downs in terms of navigating the company through them? Yeah, well, I wish I could say that, uh, that uh, I was able to discern the, uh, 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 that I was able to discern the FDA in this matter, all right, uh, uh, accurately, mm. all right. Uh, I wasn't, all right. And uh, uh, what happened with us is uh, we had uh, we we actually had uh, positive indicators, including let's say within uh, a month of that uh, uh, CRL letter, which was a month of, before the Paducah date. We had uh, we were already engaged in a process for negotiating the labeling, package insert, full disclosure, all that. And usually in that process, the experienced uh, folks will tell you that's a great sign that you're on your way to an approval. Mm-hmm. Well, it didn't happen that way. So uh, we did have uh, we we had uh, we had a gap. We had one thing that was not in that filing. And it had to do with manufacturing, a manufacturing test of all things on mm-hmm. a final finished product. So we had a test that was completed, but had not been validated. And the validation would not be complete until the end of, uh, let's say, end of October or thereabouts. So we thought the FDA was going to give us uh, a conditional approval and, uh, Basically, with the with the condition that uh, that validation test be completed, well, they chose to give us a CRL. So, uh, in their infinite wisdom, whatever. So that was very very disappointing to uh, to all of us. Uh, but you know, we had to move on, and we we adapted uh, very quickly to that uh, situation. We're confident we're we're getting this drug approved. Mm-hmm. So it's for a rare cancer. And it definitely will save lives uh, or or extend people's lives, I should say, over yeah. time. So uh, uh, that uh, it it should be it will be approved. Yeah. What is that course correction? Uh, you know, I mean, CR, CRL, let, let, the, the, the letters happen. Uh, I've talked to plenty of biotech execs who have, who have muscled their way through these things. Um, but what does that course correction look like from from your purview, like from from your office? What do you have to do as the leader of the company to maintain that course correction? Well, I think, uh, you know, I think, first of all, uh, I, you got to keep every, everybody should be, uh, continue being highly motivated, you know, because uh, the, the, uh, the, I like to look upon myself as uh, sometimes when I'm asked what I am. So either I'm the company philosopher or the company cheerleader, or maybe mm-hmm. both. All right. So basically, 
it's important to maintain that your staff, uh, your your team, has uh, has same attitude that you have. That uh, you're you're enthusiastic, you're positive, you're gonna you're gonna overcome what this is about, and they and you have to respond, uh, you know, very quickly to the FDA. Get back to them with uh, your plan, what you're gonna do, how you're gonna uh, your resubmission. So they so that's a word. We 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 jump very quickly on that, and uh, we got uh, we got a response back from the FDA that uh, indicated that they're in agreement with what we're doing, and so we'll be resubmitting uh, somewhere towards uh, the end of the year, beginning of, uh, of the year, somewhere in that time frame, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and then the uh, the FDA will give us a new Padupa date, so we'll we'll see what that looks like then at that time. Yeah, but it's yeah. it's a uh, you know, psychologically, initially, when you get hit with it and you weren't expecting it, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a blow. Yeah, right? things. You you should, you just took a punch in the mouth. All right, yeah. and you better step right back and and, and get back in there. Yeah, so, uh, and you can't you can't uh, you can't dwell on it too long. I don't I don't like dwelling on on anything like that. So. Mm-hmm. You just got to move ahead. Yeah. Um, from a, from a, a business, like an operation standpoint, um, is, is this something that you like financially are prepared for, or do you end up, or, or is it a combination of, you know, trying to be prepared for it financially and also turning some, some levers and dials to, to, to make adjustments to, to, to see it through. We're we're looking good on the financial side, so plus the 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 cost of what uh, that is is not going to affect us at all in terms mm-hmm. of the financial side. Yeah, it's not as if you know we had no uh, our clinical side is clean. Basically, that's been accepted. There's no side effect issues. None of that. It's it's a, all of a sudden if you suddenly have to repeat a clinical trial or or something like that, that's an issue. That's a real issue. But yeah. I think this not to say it's not an issue, but uh, uh, you can uh, you can basically overcome it uh, uh, efficiently mm-hmm. and quickly. Yeah. Is there any specific advice you would give a, a young first time uh, bio biotech exec uh, to, uh, like I said, either prepare prepare for it either uh, organizationally, financially, or, or or psychologically? Yeah, well, I think you have to be prepared. You know, in, in our business, you got to be prepared for these uh, these moments. They happen, and also. What uh, uh, what that really teaches you is that uh, if if you have, if, if you have a single product company, yeah, that is that's the riskiest position of them all. Mm-hmm. So uh, and uh, we were we were fortunate that we were able to bring this asset on board than fear to really uh, help defray that uh, you know the risk that's there. So uh, we're 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 in a much better position as a result of that. Yeah. So and we were a single product company uh, actually for the longest time. Right. So and I and I always uh, even though I felt confident about it, I just uh, I was never comfortable with the fact that it was a single product company for the most part. Yeah. Even though you know you, you can talk about those other assets, but uh, yeah, that, that was the principal one. That was it. So. Uh, and and look what happened. COVID came along and delayed our clinical trial. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so as a result, uh, bringing something else, we, we it, it worked out that. Uh, and by the way, it was a, it was not an easy process for us to get that asset. We had to go through an auction process. Mm. So, uh, and that that had its own set of uh, characteristics. Is I, I've I've not heard that. I mean, I, you know, I've, that's new. Is is that a is that somewhat is a is a rel- relatively common practice? Yeah, I mean, you know, if if uh, if uh, good assets come on board or become available to you, yeah, and a banker brings it to you, or a, uh, or a broker, usually it'll be an auction process, hmm. uh, and. You, you like to stay away from them if you can, and uh, you like to see if you can't go out there and find something ahead of that auction process if you can. So, uh, but an auction process is an auction process. It's uh, it's yeah. it's uh, real interesting. Hmm. 
Um, do you, do you continue to, to drug hunt, so to speak? Yeah. Yeah, we do. So we have a B, we have a full, uh, full-time BD person on board with us. So, uh, and he's out there all, all the time looking yeah. at things. So, uh, you just, uh, sometimes it's been my experience in the past. If you could get there by yourself without having to uh, do the auction, you're much better off. Yeah. You, you can negotiate a, uh, uh, a deal on your financial terms as opposed to suddenly the auction dictating what those financial terms are. Yeah. That's a different story. What's um what what is the update on uh on the clinical pipeline today? Like I mean, we we you know obviously we just discussed lymphia and menolock a little bit. Like what what are some of your next immediate steps in in uh, clinical well, so progress? With Minolock, we're uh, we're we're uh, more or less at the end of that. Uh, we're getting to the end of that trial soon. Mm-hmm. So uh, we'll have uh, what we did is we expanded that trial into India. To uh, to bring it across the finish line quicker, so uh, and uh, that process is underway. It's an event driven trial, so and the event is a negative event, and that is uh, time to catheters failing, mm. or time to catheter failure. It's a comparison of our lock solution to a what what uh, what I term a home brew that the hospital mixes up. So what happens is with the uh, with, uh, with patients that have infected catheters, is the, the standard of care is to remove the catheter and replace it with a new catheter. So, uh, and usually what happens is, uh, initially the catheters are placed, uh, inserted uh, uh, subclavically by the collarbone. When they, and it has to be, sur- it's surgically implanted. Yeah. And it gets threaded to the heart. So, uh, if that catheter gets infected, they have to remove it surgically, and then they have to replace it surgically. And usually, though, a lot of times, uh, the new catheter is placed down by the groin. It gets threaded up. There's about a 20% adverse event profile associated with it. So what happens in a certain number of certain percentage of cases, though, there are patients that no longer have access points that can be used for a replacement catheter. Mm-hmm. The hospital will mix up, uh, I call it a homebrew, of a, an antibiotic solution that they'll, where they'll try to salvage that catheter if they yeah. can. So uh, that's what we're. That's what our trial is being compared is is all about. Uh, so our goal is ninety two events. We've crossed we've crossed the ninety two event line, but uh, we're taking it over in order to give us uh, uh, a better margin in terms of on a statistical side, just to make sure that there are no issues on, uh, on, uh, on the patient counts when we get there. So somewhere in the course of somewhere in 24, we'll be, we'll have a top line data readout on this and then we'll, we'll go to the agency with the data. Yep. Very good. So, uh, are, are there any, uh, so we talked about the, the stem cell product sort of being shelved for now. Are there any other, um, candidates that uh beyond these two that uh are are yeah. not shelved or potentially yeah, we, have, we have one that's a little bit i call it far afield and it's a hemorrhoid drug yeah so uh that's something when we merged in with Sidious, they had in their portfolio so it's a legacy drug uh we weren't going to keep it initially but we took a good look at it and we realized something in the uh in the 21st century there isn't a single FDA approved prescription drug for the treatment of hemorrhoids. It's hard to believe. That is hard to believe. And uh, you have the over the counter market that have products like Preparation H, but that's Preparation H can ha- uh, handle uh, grade one hemorrhoids, not grades two, three, four. So, uh, so we thought, all right, uh, since they were working on 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 a formulation that they had that. Uh, it could be a category if we don't spend a lot of money on it that we could if we can prove some efficacy we can sell it off to a major player because it is a i think it's a market potential is gigantic there are mm. there are several million patient visits to uh to doctors offices annually in the united states for hemorrhoids so uh but this requires somebody with a, a larger sales force direct to consumer advertising it's not our model right 
So, uh, so uh, we've been working with a formulation that uh, it contains halo betazol, which is a fluorinated uh, high potency steroid combined with lidocaine. We've uh, just completed recently a phase two B trial that looks uh, looks positive. We're going to go to the FDA with it and uh, uh, work out a, a phase three protocol. If the phase three protocol has uh, uh, a, a number of patients that makes it uh, really economical for us to execute on it, we will in order to, to put it in a better position for uh, ultimate license or sale to a to a pharma partner. Mm. So that uh, that like I said, it's far afield from those other two drugs, but it sure uh, is. Never left. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what I mean. Like when when I look at the you know the the pipeline and these candidates, like they're they're the indications are are far and wide. Uh, the the modalities are are far and wide. Does does that create challenges for the business in terms of you know you've got twenty two people, high you know highly disciplined professionals? Yeah, um, really. Are are they just they're they're multi yeah, uh, yeah, multi adept? Yeah, it doesn't matter what the drug is. So uh, okay, they're pros. So it's easy to handle. Easier, yeah. let's put it that way. Yeah, good deal. All right. Well, I know we're getting short on time here, Leonard. I don't want to. I, I want to be respectful of your time, but I do want to ask you about another another thing we talked. Another person that we talked about in our initial conversation. Yeah. You, you you told me a couple stories about one of the. You know, every, everyone's got a mentor, right? Like, um, you you right. probably you're probably a mentor to several people at this point. <laughs> I'm sure in your career, um, and have been over the years. But you told me stories about uh, Parker G. Montgomery, who yeah. is a man who. Uh, as, as as I understand it, he's he's like a hundred years old. He's got to be oh, ninety three, I think, at this point, or ninety. Yeah, close. Oh, right. You're ninety. You're ninety three or a hundred. We'll round up. <laughs> I mean, he's. He, uh, but but he was a big influence on you. Tell me who who is he and uh, what so what impact did he, he have he on was, your? He was the founder CEO of the very first company where I worked. I, I was there for ten ten years. It was called Cooper Laboratories. He made a hundred and fifty acquisitions. All right, I want you to think about that. 150. Right, think about that environment, what that was like. All right. So, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, you know, I what happened was I started out on the sales side and I got uh, uh, promoted after uh, about a year and a half to being a market research analyst. And a uh, short period after that, I found myself uh you know, putting uh, deal presentations together. Uh, I was in, I got, at one point, uh, I got promoted uh, overnight from uh, being a product manager to being uh, responsible for strategic planning. And it was done by, uh, believe it or not, it was done by him. We were all at a, at a, uh, uh, at a strategic planning meeting in the Poconos then. And, uh, and it was on the uh, Cooper had invested in a small eye care company uh, that was doing like $10 million in revenue. And Parker wanted that business to really get up there and become a $100 million company quickly. Uh, I, you know, I, I so, uh, so during that session, what happened was uh, at one point, he just turned around and said, okay. Leonard, you're now uh, you're no longer going to be in marketing. You're going to be in strategic planning, and uh, uh, I want you to come back here in 90 days. I want to plan on how we're going to get to 100 million dollars, and at the same time, he said to me, he said, "You're also going to do all your boss's paperwork because he hates to do paperwork." Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh that was that was <laughs> that's how it was. Okay. Yeah. So, it was a different uh, this was a different day and age in, yeah, in business. I know, I know, yeah, I know. So uh but it was a great opportunity for me because I did. I put together a whole strategic plan on how how to develop that business. Uh uh it got ultimately it was called Cooper Vision. It went from 10 million to 600 million. Yeah. Came one of the world's largest eye care companies at that time. Uh, it was it was a and I worked on the beginning of it, and then uh, uh, I got assigned to I set up uh, a dermatology company. Uh, uh, we had Avino as our uh, our principal uh, uh, drug back then. Mm -hmm. uh, so I witnessed firsthand. I'll give you an example on something. I witnessed firsthand how uh, it was a great growth story. The company acquires a tiny little toothbrush line. 
doing less than a million dollars in business at the time. Yeah. Oral B. Yeah. Oral B. It became I mean, the world's largest selling toothbrush. Yeah. I, I remember Cooper Vision. What, what became of Cooper Vision? What's the what? What, what became oh, of Cooper part, Vision? Today, it's part of the Cooper Company. It's headquartered on the West Coast. Okay. It's within that company. So yeah. uh, it's yeah. a very significant player. And it was the it was the right market segment to be in at that time. That specialty was exploding with technology. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, the, the, the company went out. We bought everything in sight. Baco emulsification, IOLs, uh, had the very first extended wear uh, contact lens called Permalens on the market. Uh, and, uh, you know, and Parker was a risk taker. He, yeah. he was not a technical guy. He had uh, he was, uh, Harvard Law, Harvard undergrad, was an assistant to the uh, Secretary of State at one point. Uh, and he started the company himself. He was a real entrepreneur. So, uh, which yeah. is incredible. You know, he he was really the one who, who pioneered uh, deal making and the way it was done in, way back in those days. Yeah. So uh, I just, I had to hand it to him. You know, I, I, I'll give you an example of uh, how, how that risk taking side worked with him. So, because uh, I was part of the group that was doing the evaluations. So what happened was uh, they the company had this extended wear technology, uh, but it still had to go through a phase of FDA testing. Mm-hmm. And all the outside advisors that came into Cooper told Parker and the company, don't do it. You'll never get it cleared through the FDA. So what happened was uh, Parker had a science advi- full-time science advisor uh, on staff and he was a PhD brilliant and he told Parker take the risk you mm-hmm. this will pass after all these outside experts said it'll never pass yeah so, uh, and he said okay we're doing it we're gonna go all right it worked it got yeah. approved that. so uh, and I, I saw that happen several times with uh, with him he was uh, uh like, like I said, he didn't have a tech. He was not a technical guy in the least bit. But he knew who to lean into, right? Yeah, I mean, he, knew- he did. He did. He did. Yeah. So, uh, but that company was a great experience for me. It was the kind of place where uh, you had no training. <laughs> you, 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 there is no training. There, there is just do. <laughs> this, this is it. Here's your assignment. Go. <laughs> yeah. That was a great place. You know, if you're you're a young person, you're you're eager, ambitious. You, you, know, you want to, you know. So, and yeah. they gave it to you. They gave you every opportunity to book. I mean, you know, because you know, I've inter- I interview people that come out of the large companies today, and they tell me they don't even know who they, you know. They don't even interact with the vice president of marketing, let alone the CEO of the company. But, mm-hmm. you know, we had to give presentations to the CEO and the, and the entire company all the time. Yeah. And uh, you grew up that, you know, you grew up very quickly in, those, in that kind of an environment. Yeah. It's a great place to be. And, and uh, for me, he was, he was really, he was the best. Yeah. Yeah. You talked about, is it a follow-up question on that? Cause you know, you, you, you cut your teeth back then and, and learned sort of the, the principles of risk taking in a, in a, you know, decidedly CP, you know, consumer facing consumer packaged goods industry. Uh, now, you know, to your point about the the hemorrhoid, um, the hemorrhoid candidate, you know, the intention would be to take that and, and give it to someone who knows that business and does that. So you've made quite, quite a, over the years, you've made quite this transition into, you know, the, the biotech business, which is, which is not right. consumer facing. Is, is there like in your risk analysis uh, and, and risk approach, is there any nuance like, between what you learned early on and and this business that we're in now in the in the biotech space is it is it different is it more challenging like oh, weighing think, those risks yeah 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 so basically we did by the way that company was a prescription products company also it had uh, oh, okay. well so okay. it wasn't just uh, consumer packaged goods so okay. so yeah so basically you know uh, uh i I think uh, this environment, the biotech environment, compared to that environment, was uh, that uh, the the company was still f- bottom line managed, financially managed, because uh, it, it was public. It had to report quarterly earnings, so uh, 
you had to be uh, uh, you had to be very conscientious of it. As a matter of fact, I'll, I'll tell you something interesting. The thing that uh, when, when again when we were when I was a product manager, what Parker Montgomery insisted upon that all the product managers have detailed knowledge about cost of goods. Mm. He wanted them. He wanted everybody to know how cost of goods were calculated, what went into that formula, and and uh, and all the elements of it, the overhead element, all that from an accounting side. Yeah. And again, you know, talk to you talk to marketing people today. They want they want to all they know is just a line item to them doesn't mean anything. That's not it's not how he viewed it though. So yeah. It was good for us. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it sounds like an amazing experience to, uh, like I said, I mean, build a foundation for for what you're doing yeah. today. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Good. Well, Leonard, I'm going to let you off the hook. Uh, I appreciate you subjecting yourself to my my rambling questions. <laughs> it was fun and, and enlightening. Right. I can get off my couch now. <laughs> <laughs> you can get off your couch now. Yeah. No. I enjoyed the conversation and yeah. uh, and I Same appreciate here. you coming on. Same here. Look forward to. But somewhere down the road, maybe we'll have another one. We will. I promise. Right. Okay. Right. That's Sidious Pharma co-founder, CEO, and chairman, Leonard Mazur. I'm Matt Pillar, and this is the Business of Biotech. We're produced by Bioprocess Online with the support of Cytiva, which demonstrates its support to new and emerging biopharma companies at Cytiva.com backslash emerging biotech. If you like listening in on conversations with biopharma leaders like Leonard, Subscribe to the Business of Biotech podcast. Sign up for our newsletter at bioprocessonline.com backslash B-O-B. Also, be sure to leave us a review and let us know how we're doing. And as always, thanks for listening.